I wonder what that says. Quality. This says proper quality. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what it says. Hello and thanks for joining us again. Today we're going to be doing some servicing, uh, some servicing at my house. Now, in front of you here is one of my Daikin 4MXM 68 units. I've got two of these in my house, uh, one of them running three ports or three indoor units, the other running four units the other side of the house. I'll picture that one separately. Now these, like I say, have been in around about 18 months. So I've not had cause to do anything to them really. Uh, so I figured it's time to give them a good clean up. Uh, we tell all our customers the importance of uh, servicing and cleaning of these units. So I thought I'd better practice what I preach. And I thought you might like to see what's involved in servicing one of these. There's a lot of videos about installing DIY mini splits and multi splits and things like that. But nobody really goes into the ins and outs of servicing. So we're just going to touch on a few things. And uh, also some planned alterations that I've got to add to the system later on. So hope you enjoy it. Please stay with us. Firstly, let me apologise for the wind noise. Uh, there's not much I can do about it today, I'm afraid. Uh, I do need to invest in a radio mic and some noise suppression, but for now we're just working off the good old phone. Um, so yes, this is the 4MXM68, 6.8 servicing four ports or four indoor units inside my house. Both of them been in around about 18 months. They've been doing all my heating and cooling and have completely replaced my oil-fired central heating in the house. Now, the more eagle-eyed might see that there is an extra set of lines coming in over here. I am gonna be adding uh, an additional indoor unit. We always say we service for three reasons, and those are safety, efficiency, and reliability. Now, safety, obviously, we're gonna be looking at things when we service. We're gonna be using the most important diagnostic tools that we've got, our eyes and ears, and we're gonna be looking at the unit. We're gonna be doing things like refrigeration, leak detection. We're gonna be looking at the electrics, making sure uh, there's still integrity uh, as they were left and commissioned. And, but all that aside, really, for the efficiency and the reliability unit, we need to be looking at cleaning. Now, I'll give you an example of why that is so important. Now, as you can see, the fan coil here, or the, the outdoor coil, uh, you can call it an evaporator or a condenser, regardless, uh, they, they operate either way around. This fan coil, it passes a huge amount of air through it. Now, in order to impart the energy into the coil and to reject the energy from the coil, it needs to be really clean because it has such a high surface area. Now, you can see we're mine, 18 months old. We've got leaf debris, I've got tree pollen, I've got insects, I'm starting to get a little bit of green mouldy residue. Now, these are designed for that. Um, you know, they're sort of, um, you know, they keep on working even when they're virtually almost totally clogged up. But I really want to maintain the efficiency. Uh, this unit's got a really high efficiency. This has got a seasonal coefficient of performance of around sort of 5.15 to 1. And I really want to maintain that, especially with energy bills being the way they are. So, yeah, cleaning is absolutely the most important thing that we do. So let's get on with that first. I'll break the unit all apart. We'll look at exactly how dirty it is inside and we'll get straight on with it.
right so this is our unit with all of the service covers removed we've removed the front grille cover which is just four screws and we've exposed the unit fan and we can see inside it's not actually too bad there's a small amount of debris quite a lot of cobwebs a bit of pollen um, most of it's on the reverse of the coil though because as you can imagine this fan is a, a pulling fan so the airflow comes towards us where we're looking from now so most of it's on the outside um, we're going to get most of that with brushing and then we're going to use uh, compressed air and uh, finally we'll use uh, a uh, antibacterial cleaner uh, coil cleaner as well which we'll get to in a minute so around the side of the unit here here we can see our manifold ports from the top we've got a b c and d you probably can't see that's actually stamped into the casings but each one of those ports uh, represents a, a flow and return connection if you like to each of the indoor units and you can see i've got all four of those connected up where we've got this insulation material here, here and here, we're gonna be trimming that back a little bit later and we're gonna be inspecting the refrigerant flares on this side. Um, in here as well, just some cobwebs and some loose sort of dirt and debris, we'll clean that up. Make sure there's no oxidization on the thermistor pockets and the thermistors are all secure. Um, and we're gonna connect our gauges on down here shortly as well. Uh, we'll also take this wiring cover off and have a look at our wiring little helpers and um, that's disappointing you can see my permanent marker pen where I've written on my port designations has faded away so uh, I need to look back at my notes and work out what they are but we'll bear that off in a minute and take a look at that all right better get on with some cleaning As you can see, hardly a glamorous job, but the unit is now really, really clean. So first of all, we blew it uh, out, uh, or sorry, we dusted it out with a brush and then we blew it out with compressed air. 
I find it much easier to get rid of the cobwebs and the tree pollen and the insect debris uh, dry. Um, if you just wait and just try and wash it all out, you can end up sort of clogging and it sticks. So I get rid of all the large stuff, the easy to get to stuff, first with a brush, then I use compressed air, and then finally I put the coil cleaner on, leave it around about five minutes for the coil cleaner to work, and then I set about uh, washing it through and then tackling the cosmetics at the same time. So a bucket of detergent and warm water and give everything a good wash inside and out. And as you can see, the result's pretty good, um, pretty much like brand new really, which is exactly what we'd expect. And you know, aside from efficiency, these units pose a real substantial investment for everybody, so it's nice to keep things looking spick and span and make things live as well, you know, for a long period of time. They really do need to keep working as long as possible in order for us to uh, get the, the best um, economy out of them. So, next job, we just need to dry this one out. So we'll use a, a repurposed leaf blower just to blow off the excess moisture and uh, get it all back together or get the front grill and the top lid back together and then I can start doing some of the functional checks and tests. Now that the unit's all put back together and all the cosmetic casings are put back on, my next job is to look at the electrics and the pipe work. So I'm just trying to dodge rain showers here at the moment, which isn't making things easy, but uh, we seem to have a brief lull in the rain, so we'll have a look and see what's going on. So as we've already discussed, this is a four port unit. So here you can see we've got four sets of electrical terminals. These are for each of the corresponding ports. So the way the unit works is we have one common power supply here. So we can see our incoming power here on this set of terminals. We've got our neutral and our live and we've got our earth parked there. And each of the indoor units has got its own power supply and communication wire from the outdoor unit. So the outdoor unit is powered on its own and then the outdoor unit supplies the power to each of the indoor units. So the first thing I'm going to do is just run across these, make sure they're all nice and tight. As you can see, they're all made off neatly into fork terminals. Um, I don't anticipate there being any problems, but I'll run through and check they're tight. Then I'll obviously go through, check my polarity. I'll check my earth leakage breaker inside, and uh, then we'll put the unit back on, and we can begin to go inside and look at our indoor units. Uh, sadly, there's still lots more to do. Um, all four of the indoor units need to be cleaned. The filters need to be checked. We need to check the unit operation. There's quite a lot to do. Let's get on with it. I mentioned earlier that there was a DIN rail mounted energy meter on this unit. I just wanted to show you actually, uh, you can see this one here has got 750 kilowatt hours of uh, measured uh, energy usage. It's worth pointing out that this is a four port unit uh, representing half of my home heating and cooling for uh, around about 17 months and a couple of weeks. Uh, that's pretty good going, 750 kilowatts uh, times that by two approximately. Uh, then we're looking at 1500 kilowatt hours of uh, energy to run a four bedroom house, uh, heating and cooling for nearly 18 months. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I've been really happy with these units. So, right, time to get on with it indoors.
this is the Daikin Stylish unit. This is a 3.5 kilowatt unit. Um, worth noting that the Daikin units, they're all the same physical width. So regardless whether this was the CTXA 1.5 or the 2 or 2.5 or 3.5 or 5, they're all 800 mil wide. So you saw me take off all the cosmetic covers. This is what I do when I service. I take all the covers off because without taking them off fully, you can't really see what's going on. You can't look at the pipe work. You can't get a good look at the coil. Um, I really like to strip them down. And as you saw, it only took a few minutes just to take the cover off. So just talk you through briefly what's going on in here. So here you can see our pipe work penetration to the outside. That's where our refrigeration pipe work comes through. The corrugated pipe in the lower part there, that is our condensate drainage. So as you probably know, when these units are operated in cooling mode, uh, there's condensation produced and that condensation drains away in this pan here. It forms on the uh, coil, drains away in the pan and it actually comes out, goes through the wall in this corrugated tube. And on the top there is our refrigeration pipe work and you can see all that's nearly sealed in. And our electrical cable can, oh, excuse me, comes in there as well. Underneath, you can see our corrugated drainage pipe. You can see our refrigeration joints, which are insulated off. And then round here, there's our corresponding electric plugs. Um, that's our four core cable that we saw on the outside uh, for this indoor unit. So we'll check over that pipe work as well. Now, this unit, um, the filters are really, really clean. They're just gonna need a wipe over. You saw me take those out. I'll show them to you again in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, so the next job is for this one is to wash the coil through and then vacuum the condensed drainage line to make sure that's nice and clear. And then we can look to clean the filters and put it all back together again. Here we go. That's uh, a lot of work. That's all four units uh, stripped down and cleaned, uh, put back together. I vacuumed out the condensate lines uh, with a wet vac just to make sure those are nice and clear. That has a really good effect because you put all that cleaner in on the coil and it sort of trundles its way down the condensate line, putting the aqua vac on it uh, helps pull any sort of debris that's accumulated in the corrugations of the pipe and clears that out. So I'm much happier that's been uh, done. I do that on all our customer services as well. So that's a nice bit of preventative maintenance maintenance. Um, condensate blockages are, are a really big thing and they're a big sort of primary cause of breakdowns really. Um, and we have used the coolant a lot this year um, and although we're getting them ready for the heating season I, I also want them to be ready for when they start condensing in the summer months again. So with that done all four units are reassembled. I need to move back onto the outdoor unit now. The weather's turned a little bit better so I've got a bit of time to uh, put the gauges on put the unit in force cooling operation, uh, check my temperatures on and off my fan coils, check my superheat uh, on my gauges and uh, start to wrap things up really. And also just do a little bit of paperwork as well. So let's get to it.
been about three or four minutes now with all four indoor units running in cooling mode in maximum. Uh, you can hear the fan running and you can see it running there. Really is quiet. Um, these Daikin units are super quiet. I mean, to be fair, most inverter stuff now really is quiet, but these are just exceptional. Uh, got my gauges connected, everything's looking good so far. Like I say, all four units are running in full force cooling mode. So uh, I'll just give them a few minutes to settle in and then we'll go and do some checks on the indoor units, check the uh, temperatures on and off the coils, check the unit operations. And uh, then we're pretty much done. Oh yes, just got to do um, final motor running amps and fan running amps. And uh, then we're done. There we are, one Daikin heat pump air conditioning unit service. That's one outdoor unit, four indoor units. Um, it's, it's an annual thing. Um, really pleased I did it. Um, glad that I filmed it actually. Um, this was a bit of a stocking filler of a video. Uh, it's something I had in mind doing today and I thought, you know, why not film it? You know, some people might be interested. We do have a lot of interesting videos coming up. We've got a big uh, heat pump installation coming up in the next week or two. Uh, it's actually for a YouTuber. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get on and do that. Uh, he's gonna let us film that and uh, gonna do an interview with him as well, discuss why he sort of chose to do it. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting things coming up. Hopefully maybe gonna be doing a factory visit at some point as well and looking at some new manufacturer kit. So yeah, a bit of a stocking filler video this one, but um, hope you enjoyed it. There'll be a link in the description to some of the other videos that we put out most recently. Uh, please, if you're interested, take a look. And if you are, please like and subscribe. See you next time. Oh, all right, let, just let's start with the box. I wonder what that says. Quality. This says proper quality. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what it says. Now then, look at this. Uh, is, what is that? Is, is that some sort of lightweight aluminium composite? That's aluminium composite. That just happens to look like plastic. Well, so don't quite do a 90. So, um, so keep on going. Can you just put a 90 on that for me, Rich? Yeah. Oh. Mm. That's more like a 135. Mm. I think that's a very nice 90 on there. <laughs> oh. Did this come in a Christmas crack or did you pay money for this? Amazon. Good old fashioned Amazon. Right. Come on then. Let's slide that little joker in there. Have you got it set right on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just done that. Don't need to use two hands, right? No, no. No, this, this hand is full of years of use. Oh, look at that. That's 90. Ah, then you've They're gone over 90 there. Yeah. That's all right. So it wouldn't do 90 with small sizes. Look at that. Brahma. Legit. Well, you've got to have that little tiny ounce of impressiveness of the the new. How much? I, no, 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 no. Cheapest chips. Ryan, how much? Uh, it's probably like twenty quid. Twenty pounds. Twenty pounds. Come on. I, I, <laughs> honestly, I'm... I don't know where to go with you guys. I'm saying. Let's just say I won't pay any more than 20 quid for it. No. Let's just say you won't ever have one then. <laughs> well, I can't go under 20 now, can I? You won't own such quality. It's obviously over, so I'm going to say... It's got to be 30. You wouldn't pay any more than 30 for it, would you? No. Definitely not. How much? £55. <laughs> well, in, you want in, to... In, in, English pounds. English pounds, yes, not uh, not any kind of other pounds that you can think of, but English pounds. But having said that, that is um, 
it was born completely as a trial to see how well these things work. And now we can go and buy one of Damien's snob tools, which will cost which will cost something like in the realms of about two hundred and fifty pounds. So, you know, you've got one of the little dairy triangles around the wrong way there. Well, I'm, I'm sure it'd come in really helpful. Well, just for the odd occasion, say if you were doing your big manual hand bends that go loops around like this. Um, yeah, I can see it would have a place. Maybe not that particular one, but or maybe a cheaper one. The crossbow. Um, no, not a cheaper one. The crossbow bender is a useful bit of kit. So you're pleased fair, with your purchase? For the amount of time you'd actually use it, it's probably you know for the once or twice you might use it on a job. Yeah. You know, around the back of a tight for a tight bend on a condensing unit or something like that. Then you know it's probably going to be okay. If you're sat knocking out manufacturing all day at a bench, you yeah. wouldn't use it, no. would you? No. Okay. But I wasn't about to go and spend two hundred and fifty quid on something that's just got a badge on it. Um, yeah. To find it, I use it once or twice. No, 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 and. It's not a frontline tool either. If yeah. it goes wrong, there's other alternatives. There is that thing over there. What? Skip. <laughs> Skip, no, no. But if it goes wrong, you just use a, you know, a bending spring, yeah. don't you? Or yeah. you use a, a former. Mm. So, anyway. Exciting.